Hello and welcome Mindsetters, you're on Learn Extra Live. Remember, today is Life Science Grade 11s and we are doing Animal Diversity with Ilsa. How That's are you, great. Ilsa? Good and you? Good, thank That's you. Wonderful. Please let us know what we'll be doing today. Yes, good afternoon Grade 11 Mindsetters. Today we are going to do Animal Diversity. We're going to look at specifically at the six different phyla okay. of animals. Yes, okay, that's awesome. what we're going to do. Okay, awesome. You can walk over Thank to you. your board. So you guys do know how to get hold of us. We're on facebook.com forward slash learn extra. And our Twitter handle is at learn extra. You can ask us any questions that you wish to ask on animal diversity. And any comments perhaps or answer any questions or anything that's been bugging you. You know how we're here for your every need. So please, let's be interactive today and be on our best, best, best awareness. Because it is going to be a really exciting. <coughs> show and I know all of you came rushing back from school just to see Elsa and animal diversity over to you Elsa thanks Katlejo good afternoon grade elements once again what I would like you to do is I would like to go and get a piece of paper and a pen and a pencil and a ruler because you are going to be actively involved in my lesson today so please be ready so when I say to you start doing this activity I would like you to be involved with with my lesson all right let's start we're going to look as I said now um, at animal diversity and we are going to first of all look at the classification once again. I know I did this last week but I think it's necessary to just summarize um, the classification. Now remember we did Monera and under Monera, oops I need a pen for this, all right under Monera we have done bacteria. All right then we looked at the protista, which was all the little unicellular animals and unicellular plants. Right? And then we looked at the group of fungi. We did bread mold mainly under the fungi, which were all plant-like without um, chlorophyll. So these are plants without chlorophyll. Then we looked at the whole group of plantae. If you can remember what we did there, we did um, we started off with the moss plants, which was bryophyta. We did the ferns, which was pteridophyta. We did gymnospermi, which was which was the um, gymnospermi, which was the pine tree, and then we did the angiospermi, which was the flowering plants. All right, and today we are going to focus on the group of animalia. First of all, we have to look at the characteristics of animals and see why. Why does this group of animals belong to the group or to the kingdom Animalia? Now, first of all, they have the features of living things. Now, in grade 8 already, you have actually in primary school, I think you've learned about this, that these characteristics are things like animals can breathe. They can reproduce. All right, they can feed, which means that they're actually eating food. They are sensitive to um, the environment, which means that they react to the environment. Can you think of some more? Um, all right, so they can move. All right, they can move. So those are mainly the, the, the different characteristics that, that belong to this group that makes them alive, this group of animals. Right, they are eukaryotes. Can you remember this term? That means that there is a true nucleus. All right. True nucleus. They are heterotrophs. Opposite to plants. If you can remember what was the term we used for plants? Autotrophic, which means um, that they can, they can make their own food. All right. This is heterotrophs, which means they cannot make their own food. Not make food. Okay, and that means that they have to feed or eat, so we're going to say that they have to consume food, therefore they are consumers. They are multicellular. Now these multicellular organisms are classified into the group of animals because they have now got different tissues that group together and that will form also different organs. Right. Then they lack cell walls, which means that they are animal-like. 
cell walls belong to plants, as you can remember the plant cell walls. And then in, in the animals, we have mainly structural proteins that hold together and support cells together with various, there are various skeletons. So animals have got various types of skeletons. And then they also have got most excitable cells. Now you're going to say, now what is that? That is mainly nerve cells. All right, so they have nerve cells. They have got nerve tissue. They have a, some kind of brain tissue. And also that they can obtain and integrate information and respond, which means that they have got some kind of muscle tissue that they can respond to their environment. And then animals also, as we know, reproduce sexually, and some animals can also reproduce asexually. All right, guys, those are all the characteristics of the animals, and that's why they're placed under the group of, or the kingdom of Animalia, and not under the group of Planta. Make sure you know these characteristics, because teachers love asking this question. Right, let's move on. What we are going to look at in this, in this section, we're going to discuss these six phyla. Now, there are many other phyla as well than these six, but these are the six phyla that you have to know for examination purposes. Now, if you look at these names, you're going to say, oh my goodness, they are difficult. Okay, for me also, it's quite difficult to pronounce them. It's not only about how to pronounce them. It's how you're going to spell them. So as you write them down, you're going to pronounce them to yourselves, all right? And we, what a good way is maybe to break it down into little syllabi so that you can learn how to, how to spell them. So the first phylum is going to be the phylum Paraphyra. Second phylum is the Nidaria. Then we have the Platahalmentes, the Annelida, the Athropoda, and the Core Data. Now those are the six phylums, and I'm going to elaborate on each of those phylums um, a little bit later on. Make sure that you know those phylums, because those are the six phyla that you're going to have to write down into your table that I'm going to give you as an activity. All right. Now, as we said, now all the characteristics of animals, okay, are now classified into two groups. Because of their characteristics, we're going to put these animals into two groups. We're going to put them under invertebrates. And all these animals do not have a backbone. Now, around about 95% of all our animals, that is a huge amount. Now, these animals, you don't even know about them. You don't even know they exist. You just know maybe your dog and your cat. Now, where do they belong? They belong to the group of vertebrates, which is only 5% of our animals that do have a backbone. All right, so those are our two main groups in which we're going to classify the animals, the invertebrates and the vertebrates. Now, in your table, I keep on talking about your table, but you're going to see what I'm going to, I've got an example for you of the table, and I know that they are placing the table onto Facebook. So if you're going onto Facebook, you will see there is a copy of the table, and I'm going to show you the table as well. So please go to your Facebook page and see if you can find this table and start to fill it in as I'm talking. All right. And what you're going to fill in onto the table is going to be these aspects. We're going to look at each of those phyla of animals. We're going to look at the type of symmetry. We're going to look at the number of tissue layers. We're going to look at the presence or absence of a silom. We're going to look at the presence or absence of a through gut. So those are going to be the different um, aspects that we're going to study under each of these phyla. And that is what your table is going to look like. Now, this is a very, very good way of, of summarizing this whole section on the animals. So I would like you to 
cop roughly copy down this, this table. And as I said, if you um, don't have the Facebook page, you can, or if you do have a Facebook page, please go and look for this table. And as I said, you can now draw up a rough table. These are your animal groups. Okay, these are the six different phyla, Parafera, Nidaria, Platyhomenthes, the Annelida, Athropoda, and the Chordata. All right, so these are our six phyla. And I hope you've copied this down already. Okay, in the first column, we're going to have the symmetry. Then we're going to have the number of tissue layers, whether there's a coelom or not, a through gut, and a skeleton. So I'm going to talk about each of these phyla, I'm going to talk about each of these aspects, see how many of these empty spaces you can fill in, and at the end, I'm going to give you the copy, I'm going to show you all these answers, and then it's very exciting that you go and go, can go and check and see how many of the answers you were able to fill in, and how many you have correct um, yourself. All right, so let's move on to now our first aspect, and that is symmetry. Now, what is symmetry? If I have to give you a definition of symmetry, that's the way in which all the body parts of an animal, the body parts of an animal is arranged. Is arranged. All right? And it's normally arranged around a specific point or an axis, a central axis. So that will be a definition of a symmetry. Body parts of animal is arranged the way in which they are, or you can say body parts of animal, how they are arranged or is arranged around a point. Now there's three types of symmetry. Asymmetry, radial symmetry, and bilateral symmetry. Asymmetry, always when you see that letter A, that actually means non. Okay, so that means there's no symmetry. And now if you take, I'm going to use an example of an animal you studied in this year. If you can remember the little amoeba. All right, like a little unicellular animal, remember? It's got all these little pseudopodia or false feet. Now if you have to cut that animal into two halves, you can't. All right, if you have to cut, make a cut there, there's not two similar halves. So this animal is asymmetric. Symmetrical. Let's look at the next one, which is radial symmetrical. The body can be divided into two identical, we can also say, two mirror images. Right, so the one half is going to look like the other half along any, the emphasis is on that with any 2D plane along the central axis. Now, I'm going to talk about a little animal later on called the hydra which looks like that, something like that. The tentacles, all right. Now, if I cut that animal, you're going to see from the top, the animal's going to look like this. It's got a central axis in the middle, and it's got all these tentacles around. Now, if you have to cut this animal into two identical halves, you can do it along that plane, okay? You can do it along that plane, along that plane. Each time, you're going to get two identical halves. So that's got to do with radial symmetry. Think of a radius of a circle. Okay, radial symmetry. The other one is bilateral symmetry. Bilateral, what does the word mean? If you look at the word bi, it means two. Lateral means two sides. Okay, the body can be divided into two identical halves once again, but only in one 2D plane. Now, I've got a diagram here to show you the two symmetries. Okay, first of all, that's the radial symmetry, as I explained to you now. There's the central axis in the middle. There's the central axis, or the point. Um, this reminds me of if you have a birthday cake. I'm sure you all have had a birthday cake sometime in your life where um, you had to cut the cake into exactly into, into um, exact halves to give each of your party um, um, friends a, a exact a pot, all right? So what you had to do is cut the cake like that, once like that, once like that, like that, again and again and again. Each time, you're going to have the exact same half. So that is called radial. Think of a circle 
and the radius of a circle. So that's radial symmetrical. All right. Now, if we look at the bilateral symmetrical one, there's a, there's a, a diagram of this animal, little tortoise, I think it is, or little turtle. If you, if you look at the words dorsal, ventral, what does dorsal mean? It means there's a definite top, there's a definite bottom, okay, part. There's a posterior, which is a back part, and there is an anterior, which is the front. I think these words are very important that you can remember these with dorsal, ventral, anterior, posterior. Now, if you cut this animal, you can only cut it along one plane, which is along there. All right, only one plane. You can't cut it there and there and there. You can only do one 2D plane, and you're going to get two identical halves. All right. Now, we're moving on to the next aspect, and we are going to look at the germ layers. Now, not germ like you know germs. I'm going to replace that word with a word tissue layers, germ or tissue layers. Now, where do these layers come from? I want to just quickly explain this. If you think of fertilization, all right, what happens after fertilization? We're going to have a zygote. Remember we had this when we did the plants as well. We have a zygote. After zygote, we have an embryo. There are other stages as well, but the embryo is important, and that's going to develop into embryonic layers or tissue layers. All right, so during the development of animals, this is what's going to happen. Fertilization, zygote, embryo, embryonic layers, and these are the three embryonic layers. Right, first of all, ectoderm means outside, ecto means outside, meso means middle, and endo means inside. So those three layers are the three tissue layers. Now, animals with two, all right, let's take one and three. Animals with those two layers, we're going to call that animal, we're going to say the animal is diploblastic. Okay, you have to know that terminology. Diploblastic. Diplo, di comes from two, blastic comes from layers, layers of cells. So animals with an ecto, and the endoderm are diploblastic. Now, I'm sure you can now think of the term we're going to use if an animal um, consists of three layers of cells. Yes? Triploblastic. So now, if they have an ectoderm, a mesoderm, and an endoderm, which means they have three layers, all three layers are present, we're going to use the term triploblastic. These are two very, very important words, triplo and diploblastic, that you have to have to understand. So what's the importance of these three germ or tissue layers? Now, during this embryonic development from those layers, what developed from each layer as the, as the embryo grows into, into a, an animal or into, into a human being? Okay, what happens? From the ectoderm, mainly what develops from that layer of cell is that forms mainly the skin. The mesoderm, the middle layer, all right, middle, forms the muscle tissue, mainly the muscles. There are other organs as well, but mainly those organs. The endoderm, that's in the inner layer, will form the digestive tract. Right, so... Or, um, the animals that we're going to do, that we're going to study from the simple organisms to the most complex orga organisms, is going to show the change from tissues into layers and into, t into um, complex organs. All right. This diagram is just showing that what I've just explained to you now about the, the mesoderm. Okay, I'm going to come back to this diagram actually later on because we're going to talk about the coelom. We're going to talk about the mesoderm in a bit more detail. 
Before you carry on, yes. also, would you like to take a quick break? Yes, I think we can do that. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Katheho. So let's take a break, guys. As you know, there is the table. Let's make that our challenge. I know that you guys love challenge questions. So make that your challenge question. Jot it down on a piece of paper. Fill the table in, and we'll see who fills in the most. I mean, <coughs> I know that you won't be able to write it down, but if you can, take a picture of it and then send it to us on Facebook. That would be fantastic. See you right after this. Welcome back, Mindsetters. Wow, what a quick break. And of course, as usual, there are questions and we are here to answer them for you. So, um, Ilsa, would you like me to read out one of the questions? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, so this question is by Kelly. Kelly asks, since we human beings have the same characteristics as animals do, we also have eukaryotes in our, body, uh, in our bodies. If yes, where are they situated? So can you please just clarify to her what exactly that sure. term means? Sure. Kelly, that was a good question because you know what? We've got all these very difficult terminology mm -hmm. words. Mm -hmm. And to put all of them you know, together and think, what's this one? What does that one mean? That, it, it's difficult. I do understand. But you must just know that your whole body like all the other animals, like all plants, consist of millions of little cells. So your body's built up of muscle tissue. Now the muscle tissue is made up of millions of little muscle cells. Your brain is made up of little nerve cells. Your skeleton is made up of bone cells. So the emphasis here is on cells. So if I think animal, all right, animals specifically now consist of animal cells. So your whole body is built up of these cells. Now each cell has got a nucleus, a true nucleus with a true nuclear membrane. And inside that nucleus are chromosomes. Now those are the chromosomes that you inherited from your parents. All right, so you inherit chromosomes from mom and dad. Now because you have got a tr true cell, a true nucleus, and your body consists of millions of these, we just use the term eukaryotic, which means that we, our cells are eukaryotic, which means that we are eukaryotes, meaning that every single cell in our body has got a true, true nucleus. I hope, Kelly, that that answers your question. All right. Okay, now we're going to carry on with the next aspect that you have to fill in onto your table. Remember, you're busy with your table. I hope you had time to write down all the different phyla. And like Atlejo said, you can take a photo of your, of your um, table from the Facebook and send it to us as soon as you have filled it in. But one of the aspects that you have to fill in on the table is the silom. Now, if you look at this word silom, it is pronounced, all right, something like C, okay, so you're going to say, you can say Sulom, but C Lum, all right, so that will help you a little bit to pronounce this word. What is a Sulom? It is a fluid filled cavity, which means a body cavity, formed within the mesoderm that protects internal organs. Now, I'm going to talk about this also a little bit later on, but let me just explain to you what a mesoderm is. If you look at this diagram of a flat worm, which we're going to get to later on, um, there are the three layers. Okay, There's an ectoderm, there's an endoderm, and there's a mesoderm. Now, these animals don't have a coelom. That means that they are flat. There's no body cavity. These worms are really, really flat, so there's no space for a cavity. So we're going to call these animals acelomates. A, remember I said to you, just remember the word non. No coelom. So those are animals that has got no coelom, no body cavity. Example, plat a halminthes are the flat worms, and there's no space for a coelom or a body cavity. Then we're going to into a group we, which have got a sido. Now, sido is really meaning the word false. So it's not a true silom. And this, it's also a body cavity, partially lined by the mesoderm. Now, we're not really going to study this group of animals, but the nematoda are mainly the round 
the roundworms. Well, there are so many different kinds, but we are not going to study this group of animals. We are going to concentrate on the acelomates and on the coelomates. So these are animals that have got a fluid filled, complex completely lined with the mesoderm. Now, if we look at this picture. Right, this is of an earthworm, the annelids or the earthworms. Here's the ectoderm, the outer layer, the endoderm, the inner layer. There's the mesoderm. Now, the mesoderm is split. Right, so the mesoderm is split, and in that split, there is a cavity. This is the cavity. That is called the coelom. Now, what is the importance of a coelom? Very, very briefly, it is a space, like we said, a body cavity filled with fluid. Now, this is more in the advanced animals. This is now creating space inside the body where you find internal organs like your digestive system. It gives room for movement. It give room, gives room for your digestive system to bend and to move. So the more advanced animals have got this coelom to create this space, like I said, for main need the functioning of, of the organs. All right. The next aspect that you have to fill in on your table is a through gut. Now, what is a through gut? Definition. It's a gut. Okay, so this is where your food moves in. Now, a gut is where when you eat food, the food moves along this pipe or gut, and it gets digested on its way throughout this, this pipe or this gut. Okay, so it's a gut that runs through an organism with two openings, which is the mouth and the anus, all right? So there's two openings, so that's why it's called a through gut, all right? If I just have to draw a simple diagram, if you have to remove your whole digestive tract, you're going to see that your tract is actually one long part. There's an opening at the top, the mouth. There's an opening, the anus. So it's a through gut. So food enters and the wastes will be excreted via the, the other opening. Now, what are the advantages of animals having a through gut. Now, once again, this is also showing um, the, the evolutionary route of animals from the very simple animals to the very complex animals. The very simplified animals do not have even a gut. They don't have, and in the next group of animals, will have a, a kind of a gut with one opening. And then your more complex animals have got a through gut, which is a gut with a mouth and an anus. Now, what is the advantage of these complex animals having this through gut, right? The food is continually taken in, it's digested, and the wastes are released. So we're going to call, use the word egested. So maybe I should just quickly mention your word excretion. I know that learners get very confused with these two words. You're mainly going to work with this word in a trick. All right? But excretion has got to do with body fluids. For example, you excrete sweat, which is water with all the salts and, the, and, 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 and waste products in there. And urine is excreted. It's also water with all the wastes that's excreted. Solid wastes are egested. Okay, just a brief explanation of what egested means and the difference between that and excretion. The other advantage is that it allows for specialization of parts of digestive system. Now, what does that mean? Here's a diagrammatic representation of the through gut. Okay, we start off, here's the mouth. So there's an opening, the mouth, through which food will be ingested. So that opening is used to ingest food. This food is going to travel through, so you've eaten now something, and the food goes down this tract, your esophagus, goes into your stomach where it gets digested. Then it's going to move along your intestines, all right, where it gets further digested. All the food that your body needs will be reabsorbed into the blood, and then all the waste the solid waste will eventually move down to the colon, and then this is where egestion or egestion of 
the waste will take place. So what is the advantage now of having this through gut? All right? So food can enter one opening and digestion can take place and the waste can exit another opening. And the advantage also is now that there are different organs. So you have got these organs that are very specialized. And each organ has got a specific function. And the advantage of that is that the food gets digested efficiently. Whereas we're going to see later on animals with one opening that the digestion, uh, digestion process does not take place efficiently. Right, so remember these two advantages of animals having a through gut. And this, like I said, is mainly in the more complex animals. All right, now we're starting with our first phylum. So on your table, guys, you have to now have the phylum para Fiera, para fiera. Think of the word porous. So this is the pore bearing, pore bearing animals. Think of a sponge, all right? The sponge has got lots of little pores through which water can enter the sponge. So it's something like that, okay? So it's a pore bearing group of animals. Says there, they're very simple. So this is a very, very simple group of animals which actually have evolved from the very simple protista. Now, protista are your unicellular animals, very tiny animals. And all those cells have been put together, basically, to form a sponge, to form a body um, that belong now to this group of animals, the porifera. So it's a simple, simple organism, a simple animal, and it's a porous body. This group of animals are known as the filter feeders, and they mainly live at the bottom of the ocean. Most of them live at the bottom of the ocean. Right? What do they have? Like I said now, they've got specialized cells. So they don't have tissues that group together to make organs. They just have specialized cells which have got, each individual cell have got a specific function. Now you don't have to remember the names of all these cells. Um, those cells are, are, are mainly called collar, collar cells, also called flagellated cells. These are cells that you also came across when we did the protista. There are amoeboid cells, if you can remember that from, from the amoeba. They've got specific cells which act like amoebas engulfing food. All right? So they, they have got specific little cells which have got specific little functions. Now, something interesting about these sponges is how can they reproduce is that a small Place. Let's say, there's an example of a sponge. You can see all those little pores there. Okay? Let's say a small piece of sponge break off. Okay, so we say a small piece of sponge break off consists of various types of cells. Now, this little piece can regenerate. Regenerate. And it can grow into a new, entire new organism. That makes them very successful. They grow very, very quickly and rapidly inside the ocean by regeneration. Right. There's a lovely picture. You don't have to memorize this picture. You don't have to memorize the labels. But this is just showing uh, a typical sponge, what it looks like in longitudinal section. As we are now saying, all these pores. Okay, so there's a pore. Right? Oh, that's not a good color. There's a little pore there. There's a little pore. So all these pores is why this animal belongs to the paraphera. It looks like a sponge. So what happens here is that water is drawn into these pores, water H2O, plus nutrients. That's how these animals feed. And what they do is they filter this water and they filter all the nutrients out. And all of this water now is drawn into a cavity. Into a cavity, and then whatever, if, whenever this, there's a bit of contraction taking place, this water will then leave the sponge again. So this is like a water filtering system of, 
of the water in the ocean. And all these cells, as we mentioned now, these cells, have got specific little functions. Like, for example, these cells, they've got little flagella. They circulate the water inside this cavity. But if you, if you look at this now, that is a sponge with only cells that can do specific function. There's no organs. There's no specialized tissues. So it's a very, very simplified organism, the sponges. Right. Some more characteristics that you have to fall into your table about the paraphera. Let's look at the term asymmetrical. I don't think I need to explain to you again what, a, what symmetry means. Okay. Now, why are sponges asymmetrical? Now, if you think of a, of a, of a sponge, um, maybe if I go down to this picture. All right. Look at that sponge. Beautiful, beautiful sponge deep down in the ocean. If I have to take one of those and cut it into two identical parts, I we can't. I can't even find one, okay, because they grow at such different angles. So if I have to take that sponge there, there's no ways I can cut that into two identical halves. And therefore we say sponges are asymmetrical. Right, so have you filled it into your table now? Remember, under the column that says symmetry, right? So sponges or paraphera, phylum, they are all asymmetrical. The next point, there's no tissue. There's no tissues, there's no, there are only, there, yeah, there are only cells. Cells are specialized. 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 Right, so there are no tissues and no organs. There's no silom. I was talking about a cavity, but it's not a silom. Why is, that a, why is there no silom? Because there's no ectoderm, there's no mesoderm, there's no endoderm. Right, so there's a body cavity, we mainly call that cavity a gastrovascular cavity, which means that there's food in that cavity, in that cavity. there's some circulation taking place, there's a mixture of food and water and gases in that cavity, but it's not a C-lom. So there's no C-lom. There's no through gut. Now, if you can remember, the picture of that sponge was something like that. There was a, that gastrovascular cavity, and there was just one single opening there at the top. So the water filter through and filter out that cavity again. No through gut. There's no skeleton. Now you're going to say, now how do these sponges support themselves? Now if we say no skeleton, if we think of skeletons, endoskeleton, we're going to talk about that as well. It's a bone and, and, and a bone and, and cartilage. We've got exoskeletons that insects have, and we've got a hydrostatic skeleton, which is mainly a water skeleton. Now, these animals do not have a skeleton, but their bodies are supported by substances like, for example, substances like silica, which is a type of silicon. Um, we also get calcium that can support and harden the sponges. There's also different proteins. Um, the specific protein that they have is a protein called spongin. It's a type of protein that belongs only to the sponges. So these substances support the body, but there's no specific skeleton. Right. Um, Elsa, yes. if you are asked, yes. um, how do the spongy reproduce? That's a very good question. Now, they must just remember they don't have to do reproduction mm. in detail. Okay. Um, I think I did mention earlier on, at, in, the, in the previous slide, uh, let me try and go back to that slide. If they can... All right. Um, I think I did mention it here. There. That is a way of reprodu reproducing. So what happens, as I said, a small piece of the sponge can break off. And because there are different cells, all right, the cells, what they do is they divide and they regenerate. And that little piece, because it consists of cells, can actually divide and grow into a whole new sponge. That is called asexual reproduction. Okay. Asexual reproduction, which means that there are no gametes involved. So asexual reproduction, there are no gametes involved, but some sponges can 
actually reproduce sexually, and it's a very complex okay. way of reproduc okay. reproduction. But that was an excellent question. Well yes, done. It was. Well, well done. done. Can well we take done. a quick break? Also, sure. Just sure. while we so not on a roll. Lovely. Let's take a break, guys. As you know. Questions, 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 questions. There's already so many, so I'm so impressed. And don't forget about those tables. I still want to see a table coming through the page. See you after the break. Welcome back, Mindsetters. We have reached our last segment. So these questions are very relevant. And Ilsa has gone through most of them. But if you still have some, you can still send some. But in this last session, listen carefully because she will be answering them. Even if she's not like, question, answer, question, answer. She answers them as she goes on. So with your focus, you know that you have the answers already. Hey, Ilsa. Yes, Katle, always. Over to you. Okay, sure. Guys, I'm going to run through these phylums quite quickly because I want to get to the, to the table. Okay, we're now moving on to the phylum uh, Nidaria. We, it's a silent C, so we say Nidaria. All right, these are the simplest animals with tissues. They have radial symmetry. Don't need to explain to you again what radial symmetry is. You should know it now. Now, there are two forms of this group of animals. Um, they are known as polyps. Now, polyps have got like a vase or vase, if you like to say, form, all right, or structure. And medusa, as you know, the blue bottles, jellyfish, they're more bowl-shaped like this. Now, the polyps are sessile. Now, sessile means they sit on one place, right? They are actually attached to their substrate. Now, I think this is one of the questions I've, I've read earlier on that one of the learners asked. These animals are sessile. Now, because they have got their tentacles, if you can look at this picture, right, this is a beautiful picture of a radial symmetrical um, animal, and there's the opening in the middle, the mouth. So they have all these tentacles arranged in a circle. They sit on one substrate. So what they do is they can move their tentacles around all directions to collect food. So that's the advantage of being sessile, is that they have got all these tentacles in a radius around the mouth. Right, now, some more of the information you need to fill into that table. This group... Now, they're also known as the stingers, which means that they have stinging cells. So they are mainly predators, which means that they're carnivores. They catch and capture their prey. So they have stinging cells, as you can see in this little diagram here, which is a hydra. And on the tentacles are hundreds and thousands of little stinging cells. And what they do is there's a little prey there, as you can see. So what happens is that these little cells sting and shoot out little um, stinging structures that will numb that or poison that prey and will ingest it into the mouth. Right. Radial symmetrical. Two tissue layers, which means that they are, yes, diplo, sorry, I'm writing it wrongly, diploblastic. Remember that term. No coelom, and there's only one single opening, and that is the mouth. So if you look at this hydra, like I explained to you now, there's no through gut. There's only one opening. So this animal ingest and egest through the same opening. We're moving on to the next phylum, which is the plat. A, how, men, face. You see what I've done here? Yeah? I've broken it down into syllabi. Um, and I always say to my learners, these worms are how plat, which means that they are very flat. That's the way to remember it. How plat. All right. They're very, very flat worms. So there's no space for a silom either. They have a pharynx, which is a muscular feeding tube, so they actually draw their food into their mouth. They have a complete gut, but there's only one opening. It's not a through gut, even though they have a, a, a complete gut, but it's not a through gut. All right? They lack a body cavity. As I said, they're very 
flat, so they belong to the group of acelomate animals. And here's a beautiful picture of a planaria, which is one example of the flat worms. Some more information that you need for your table under the flat worms. Okay, so plat alhaminthes means flat worms. They are bilateral symmetrical, or they've got bilateral symmetry, meaning that they have got, now if you look at this picture, it's beautiful. They have got a front. As I said earlier on, there's an anterior and there's a posterior end. Now, these animals have got in the anterior end, they have got some kind of nerve tissue concentrated in one area. They have some nervous tissue in one area, which makes them now more advanced than the previous group of animals that were the stinging cell animals that sit on one place. These animals can now actually move. They can move in a specific direction, which is forward, so they can move towards their food. And that's a big advantage for animals that have got now all these sense organs situated in the front. There is a, there is a word for this. I'm going to give you the word, all right? Because they have got all these sense organs situated in the front, we say that they are cephalized, cephalization. You might have heard of this word, all right? So it means that all these sense organs are situated in the frontal area together with eyes. And, and later on, you'll see the other animals, they've got more complex sense organs like a nose and a mouth and ears. That's cephalization. Three layers of cells, meaning that they are triploblastic. Triploblastic, all right? Also more advanced. Previous animal group was diploblastic. There's still no silom, flatworms, and as I said, there's a single opening. The next group of animals, the phylum Annelida. Now, Annelida are the segmented worms, like the earthworms, segmented worms. An example there is the earthworm, and I'm sure you all know what earthworms are. They are in your garden all the time, so you must know the earthworms. They have a sulom. There's a definite body cavity, the sulom, which serves as, for this animal, as a hydrostatic skeleton. So earthworms do not have a skeleton, but their bodies are supported with water, which is inside the sulom. They have a complete digestive system, which means that these animals have got a through gut, a through gut, mouth and anus on the other end. They have a closed circulatory system, which means that they have got a system of blood for transport, also much more advanced now than the previous group of animals, which is the um, platelmintheus. They have a nervous system, Still a simplified nervous system, but they do have a nervous system. Some more information about these flat worms, I mean, sorry, not the flat worms, the segmented worms, it's bilateral symmetrical. I've explained that. There's three tissue layers, there is a coelom, there is a through gut, there's no skeleton, but there's a hydrostatic skeleton, which is water. The next group of animals, I don't know if you, we're going to have time to get to the Athropoda and to the big group of Chordata. I doubt if we're going to get there. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to move on to the answers. There's Athropoda. There's the Chordata. Just quickly, these are animals with a, with a cord, with a nota cord, which is they've got nerve tissue. This is the group where... Uh, we belong to that group. The fish belong to that group. The frogs and the reptiles belong to this group. Right. Now, I want you to have a look. And sorry, I had to rush that last two. Yeah, or the one, two, three, four, five, six phyla. All right. Remember we said phyla. I want you to quickly check and see how many of these answers you got right. Now, if you... If you didn't finish it, please, guys, this is a very, very important um, way of summarizing this whole group of, of animalia. And if you can learn it, you can maybe add a bit more detail to each of these, of these um, words. 
understand what these words mean. Okay, I want you to have a look and just see if you have got them all right. Remember symmetry. Okay, so check your symmetry. Asymmetrical, radial, bilateral. Right, so all of these are bilateral. Number of tissue layers, one, two. Th those have got all three. These are all the advanced animals. All right. Good luck, Red Elevens. I hope that you have got that table in order and study it very, very well, and good luck. Thanks, thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Ilsa. Thank you, Mindsetters. And of course, we always have new Mindsetters. Nicole, you are our new Mindsetter for today. Just a quick shout out. Remember, our Twitter handle is at Learn Extra. And join us also on Facebook. All the learners are very friendly and very nice on Facebook and Twitter. So make sure that you come on and we'll give you great big hugs. To all of the Mindsetters, Thank you guys, you guys are always so amazing. And remember, Life Sciences will be back same time, same place next week, Wednesday. Call all your grade 12 learners. We'll see you guys next week. Bye guys. <laughs> <laughs>